If you have a Bible this morning, go ahead and reach for it and quickly turn to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 2. What an honor, what a privilege it is to be here in Charlotte, North Carolina at the world famous Elevation Church. I so love and admire this church and what God has been doing here and have been learning from afar for many, many years and just counted an honor and a privilege to even get to stand on this stage and speak with all of you. Uh, it's a real privilege for me today. And uh, I would be crazy not to just take a moment just to thank God for your pastors, uh, Pastor Stephen and Holly Furtick. And I, um, I'm just so grateful for the both of you. And it's, uh, it's a real honor to get to even be around you. I feel like, honestly, every time I get in your presence, I, I leave better. I think better. I dream bigger. And your voice, Pastor Stephen, I, I think is a once-in-a-lifetime voice, and I just want you to know I'm always behind you. You always have a friend in me, and your life and your leadership has made a world of a difference in mine, and thank you so much for letting me come and be here today, and uh, Holly, I just think you're the greatest. I just uh, I love chatting with you. I love you so much. Come on, can you thank God for your pastors today? Honestly. And I think you guys have got the best youth team here. I got to meet Chelsea and my good friend Tim back in the day. Come on, can you make some noise for the entire youth team, all the volunteers? This is... I mean, I feel like anybody who goes to church at 9 a.m. on a Thursday morning, you're getting like a massive mansion in heaven. So congrats. You're on the right path already. But my name's Rich. I come from Miami, Florida. I pastor a church there called Vu Church. Vu is just short for the word rendezvous. And uh, we've been going for about four years. Uh, my wife, she sends her greetings. Been married to the same woman now for uh, be 13 years next month. Praise God. And um, my wife and I, we actually went on a, a really big journey of trying to have kids and we couldn't have kids. And uh, last January, January 2018, after eight years of trying to have kids, our God who still works miracles, my wife gave birth to our firstborn son. Can, can somebody thank God today that still working miracles? And I wish uh, I wish my son was here because you would love his name is Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson. Okay. His initials are WWW. We call him World Wide Web for short. You know what I'm talking about? Like, he's a legend. And uh, being a dad has been the greatest privilege of my life. Um, I'm, just, I'm just into it. Like, I get real emotional. I'll probably cry here a little bit talking to you about him because when you wait that long for a miracle and then you get it, it just matters even more to you. And every day he just grows and I just enjoy being his dad. I'll never forget the first day I was in the hospital and the nurse, she came over and said, Mr. Wilkerson, um, it's so important that when Wyatt's little, that you spend time with him in what we call skin to skin. I'd never heard of this before. I'm 35 years old. Like, I don't know anything about babies. And I guess this is a thing that when a baby is a baby, like they need to take their shirt off. I gotta take my shirt off. And he's supposed to lay on my chest skin to skin. It's like for his nurturing and for his development. I never heard of this, but I'm obsessed with it. We do it every day now. Poor kid's gonna be 15 years of age. I'm like, take your shirt off. Get over here, skin to skin. I wanna nurture you. Dad, I'm 18. Shut up. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. Take your shirt off. Let's go, skin to skin. I'm just, I'm into being a dad, and uh, I wish he was here, because you would love him, and he's the greatest, and pride and joy of my life, but my, my family sends their hello, and I feel like I brought a message with me today. Um, I want us to look at a few verses in Mark chapter 2, and then I'm just going to holler at you, and shout at you, and stir you up on this Thursday morning. Um, I don't come from the biggest church, but I come from a loud church. And so today, I don't know what your background is, but I give you full permission to tap into your inner Pentecostal. You could say, amen. You could say, I like that. You could say, that's for my neighbor. You could say what my church says, preach it, white boy. I don't care. I don't care. In fact, on the count of three, let's just try one of those so I know I'm in the right church. Ready? One, two, three. It's a racist section right here. Pray for this. I'm serious. These people. Mark chapter 2 is where I want us to look and uh, spend a little bit of time today. I have a very practical message, but I think it's one that could change the rest of your summer and really change the rest of your life. It says this, starting in verse 1, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Someone say word. word. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. 
Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, someone say their faith. Their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in this spirit what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. And I love that little last phrase. I think that whenever we gather around the name of Jesus, we ought to leave going, we've never seen anything like this. And I want to preach a message today entitled, Check Your Circle. In fact, look at your neighbor and say, yo, check your circle. Look at your other neighbor, the one you don't like so much, and say, yo, check your circle. My prayer as we finish this session today is that this would be a little anthem for you for the rest of the summer that you would say, check your circle. And I believe the Lord's going to speak to us. Would you pray with me now? God, we thank you so much that you brought us here. We thank you, God, that you are moving on this Thursday morning. Lord, we lean in now to what it is that you're saying. We haven't come to play games. We haven't come to be distracted. We've come to hear a word from you. We open up our hearts. Lord, speak to us. Have your way. Lord, we don't want to be the same. Lord, I pray that right now, God, at the sound of my voice, that you would begin to move, that lives would be changed, that people would be marked in this moment forever, that people would go back on their faith journey, and they would remember this Thursday morning as a day that they made a decision to follow you like never before. We believe you can do it, and we believe that you will do it. We love you. We praise you. And if you agree with that prayer, all of God's people said? Amen. Come on, all of God's people said? Amen. Come on, if you love Jesus, make a little bit of noise. I did, a, um, I did a study earlier in the year. I was studying this theologian. His name's A.W. Tozer, and he has these uh, seven rules for self-discovery. And the premise of his, of his study is that you need to identify like, who you are. I think if we're not careful um, in church, we can get really good at at, at talking about our projected self or, or talking about stuff but not actually identifying who, who, we, who we actually are. God's not interested in, in your projected self. He's, he's interested in the actual self. He, he wants to identify who you actually are so he can develop you into who you're called to be. And I think in life, like, I don't know if you notice it, but like, some people just lack major self-awareness. Have you ever noticed this before? Like, they just, I was on the airplane the other day and um, I had my AirPods in and I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like the AirPod is like an international sign for I'm unavailable right now. <laughs> and so I'm like rocking on the airplane. And this guy, he keeps like tapping me on my shoulders. I have to pull my AirPods. And I'm like, what's up, bro? He's like, how you doing? I'm like, I'm doing good. How are you? And he's like, oh, yeah, we chat for a little bit. I'm like, I thought the conversation was done. I put the AirPods back in and I'd be hanging out again. And two minutes later, he tapped me again. Where are you headed? I'm like, bro, I'm headed to Dallas. We're both headed to Dallas. What's up, you know? <laughs> And I started thinking to myself, if, I, if we can miss it socially, how many know we can miss it spiritually? We can. And the reality of it is, is that you can't change what you fail to confront. And today, I've come in here, and I don't want to deal with your projected self. I want to deal with the actual self. Who are you really? Who are you really? Because Tozer would say there's seven different ways for us to discover that. He would say things like, you are what you think. You are who you admire. You are where you spend your money, where your time goes. I can talk about a lot of those, but there's one rule that I think is perfect for us to chat about today. A.W. Tozer would say, if you want to discover who you really are, he would say, you are the company that you keep. Meaning, your circle of friends is an indication of who you actually are, who you are becoming. You show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. You point out your five best friends, and I will prophesy to you about your next five years. And I'm not even a prophet, hello. <laughs> because it's just true. The people you surround yourself with are shaping your future. Someone say, check your circle. Check your circle. It's important who you are aligning yourself with. 
This is why the scripture over and over again will talk to you about this kind of stuff. I mean, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. That's good news. If you lack wisdom today, the scripture says, get around people that are wise. But look what the second part says. It says literally that a companion of fools suffers harm. Have you ever considered the reason why you're always hurt is because all of your friends are fools? Oh my God, he's mean. <laughs> Check your circle. Well, the scripture says in Proverbs, uh, go to that other scripture if you can, go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, do not be misled. So, so like, don't like, don't sit around and be like, I think this is what's going on. No, wait, wait, this is maybe what's happening. Don't, you don't have to come up with theories. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Have you ever stopped to consider the reason why you're never able to finish anything you start? It's not because you're not gifted. It's not because you're not talented. It's not because God hasn't called you. The reason why you can't finish it is because you lack character. Because every time you step out, you don't have the stuff it takes to finish. Yet the only way you're gonna get rid of bad character is you're gonna have to actually go ahead and get rid of bad company. The moment you remove bad company, you're gonna start getting some good character. Somebody say, check your circle. I love this one. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, I'm not talking about you don't know some people at school that don't know Jesus. I'm not talking about we separate from the world. The scripture says don't be yoked together with unbelievers for what righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness. It says don't be yoked up. Now, this is like a kind of a weird illustration because like we're not farmers and we don't like live on a farm. We live here in Charlotte. We go to like the coolest church ever. It's amazing. But like a yoke is a wooden object that was put on two oxen. And this, this device was put on their shoulders so that they could plow a straight line when they were farming. Yet you would never put a strong ox with a weak ox because if you did, they wouldn't go in a straight line. They would go in zigzags or at worst, they would start going in circles. Some of you already understand this illustration because you've been coming to Youth X now for a couple of years, but every time you get back here in the month of July, you're like, dang, man, I've been hearing these messages, but why is it I'm still in the exact same place? Maybe it's because you keep yoking yourself up to some people you have no business with. And so you're going in zigzags, you're going in circles. But today, maybe it's time to check your circle so you can head to your destination. I wish I could get a witness on a Thursday morning. Somebody give God some praise. Someone say, check your circle. And this whole premise I'm talking about is not like a Thursday morning talk, topical, one-off message. This is a central theme of God's word. Like you need to understand that God is a relational God that literally, think about this. The first problem in the Bible was not sin. It was solitude. Meaning God created Adam and then he said, yo, it's not good for man to be alone. You ever consider the fact that like Adam's walking around with God, like you think he would have everything, but God's like, no, 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 you, you need relationship. You, you need partnership. You need people in your life for you to fulfill the calling I have for you. And, and literally like we know the story of like what happens in the garden, like he eats the fruit and sin enters the world. And what happens when sin enters the world? It's not just that they're gonna result in death. It's that relationship with God is severed and relationship with each other is severed. This is why God sent Jesus to the earth. Just think about this. Jesus was known as the friend of sinners. Out of all the nicknames he could take on, we serve a God who wants friendship with us. Jesus, when he went to the cross, the cross is the most heroic act of friendship history has ever seen. For when Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't just restoring our vertical relationship with God, but also when he died on the cross, he was restoring our horizontal relationships with each other. He was saying, if you follow me, I can show you how to have healthy relationships. Come on, if you believe it, somebody give God some praise. Where, where's, I, I think there's someone who's going to help me really quick. Where's my man? Can, can you come up here real quick, bro? What's your name? Jared? Get over here, bro. You're amazing, man. Make some noise for Jared really quick. Get up here. How old are you? How old are you? Uh, 18. 18. Where are you from? Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte? You, you single? Yes. Oh, wow. 
What's your cell phone number? No, I'm kidding. Um, Jared. Okay, Jared, you, look, you go to the gym? Yeah, you look strong. Hop up on this bench really quick. Here's what I just want to show you really quick. Jared's going to hop up here real quick. He's the man. Just jump up. Can you stand up there? I'm sorry. We, and just be careful because we don't have insurance and stuff. So, okay. Um, here's the deal. This is what happens to a lot of us in friendships is that we get this whole like savior complex going on that we think we can save people and help people and we can bring people up. And so I, I want to remind you today that you, the, the scripture, Jesus said, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Our job is to fish. It's God's job to catch. Two totally different things. And a lot of us, what happens is we come to Youth X and we get in this atmosphere full of faith and God starts changing us and we start walking on a new path and we start living out purpose and living for our calling. But what happens is we get back to the school in the fall. We're like, all right, I'm going to save everybody. But like, you're pretty strong. Jared, I just want to see, can you just, just pick me up to you? Can you just, just pick me up there? Can you just hold me like a baby? I love you. All right, all right. So he's very strong. Like, it's a basic illustration. Like, he can struggle, and maybe, maybe he can maybe get me up there. But if there's two of us down here, he's going to have a hard time. But watch this. Watch how easy it is. Now, you're pretty strong, so just try to stay up there. But, like, watch how easy it is for me just to, just for me to get Jared to come down. Be careful. <laughs> it's always easier to pull someone down than it is to pull someone up. Give Jared a big round of applause. Give Jared a big round of applause. You're amazing. You're amazing. A lot of us today, it's a really, really simple message. We have to check our circle because we keep getting pulled down. It's not because God doesn't have a plan for you, and it's not because you're not amazing, and it's not because you're not going to change the world. It's simply because you got the wrong circle around you, and they keep pulling you down. I want to take the next 22 minutes, and I want us to examine Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 is a really cool story in the Bible that throughout the years I've found myself preaching the text, but, but today I want to take a different, different perspective on it. Um, the story is about a man who's paralyzed. We don't know how he became paralyzed. We just know that he's unable to walk. And then these four guys one day, they come by and they see him and they, they pick him up and they take him to where Jesus is and he gets saved and he gets radically healed. It, it's, it's a beautiful story. Yet you've got to know the context of Mark 2. I think it's important that the thinking in that day is that if you were paralyzed, it was because of your sin. This is what they thought. The theology was that God's mad at you, and therefore, if you're paralyzed, you've done something wrong. And because you were seen as a sinner, traditionally, people that were paralyzed or had disease, they weren't allowed to live in the city. They were pushed outside of the city. They would live oftentimes in the desert or the wilderness, and they were allowed to come in during the day to beg for money, but they were outcasts in society. Yet, I know who this man becomes, and I know this man's breakthrough, and I know this man is going to walk, and I know he's going to get saved, but I want to take Tozer's concept for a moment. And A.W. Tozer would say, you want to know who you actually are? Not who you say that you are, but who you actually are? One of the ways you can tell who you actually are is simply by the company that you keep. What was it about this man who was paralyzed that he was able to attract such strength even though he was considered to be an outcast? I know what's going to happen in his life, but I think for a lot of us, we can relate today with somebody. I want to know who you are before your breakthrough. I want to know what you did before you got your miracle. I want to know how you were living before you found success, before you got the desire of your heart. Because something about this man we can learn today when it comes to getting the right circle around us. Someone say, check your circle. The first thing I see about this guy in Mark chapter 2 and is, that, is this man, he didn't, he didn't tolerate being treated like a victim. This is big. He did not tolerate being treated like a victim. Society said, you don't belong. He didn't believe them. This is important because it doesn't really matter what other people believe about you. It matters what you believe about yourself. This man is being pushed out of the city saying, yo, you're a sinner. You don't belong here. Uh, you don't get to live in this world, so you need to go live out there doing your own thing. But something about this man that was different from most people, he's like, nah, 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 you can say that about me, but I'm not going to believe that about myself. 
See, it wasn't because of this man's sin that he was paralyzed. It's just called life. Life is going to happen. I wish I could tell you that you're gonna be here today and because you came to Youth X, your entire life is gonna be better and perfect now. But it doesn't actually work that way. Sometimes following Jesus, it doesn't get easier. It gets harder. And the question you have to define today is how are you gonna respond when bad things happen to you that you did not cause? Because a lot of us, when it comes to our circle of friends, we would rather be coddled instead of being challenged. I am coming down your lane today. Um, my, my, my son, Wyatt, I just like, you love this kid. He's amazing. Uh, he's 17 months old right now, and he's in swim lessons. I mean, this kid's a prodigy. I didn't even know you could take swim lessons at 17 months, and he's amazing. Like, he is Michael Phelps, watch out. Wyatt Wesley is on the run. He's Aquaman, too. This kid loves the water. And literally every day, he's in the, wa- he's in the water. We wake up in the morning, he goes, Dad, pool, pool. Dad, dad, pull, pull. And he always goes, pull, and then he puts his knuckles out. He goes, knuckles, you know, he wants to do knuckles. And uh, we swim every day, and yesterday we were out in the water, and he held his breath for eight seconds. I've got 35-year-old men in my church that can't do that. I mean, this kid's special. And he's swimming, and uh, his mom was gone out of town a couple weeks ago in England. She was gone for like a week, and you know, there wasn't much bath time in the Wilkerson home, but there was a lot of pool time. Dads are like, yeah, the chlorine will kill it. You know, that's, that's how I live my life. The chlorine will got it, you know. And so why he's swimming, and the other day I had this funny experience with him because I just want you to get this. He's 17 months of age, and he's, he's in a pool of water. Like, he's swimming in a pool of water. And we're sitting on the steps together, and all of a sudden, the sprinkler system turned on. And you know the sprinklers? They went, <laughs> and these drops of water started hitting my little boy. And when these drops of water started hitting Wyatt, he started to freak out. It was, it was interesting. We're sitting in a pool of water that he's been swimming in, and now drops of water from the sprinkler are coming and hitting him, and he's, ah, he's screaming. And I'm like, Wyatt, dude, quit being such a baby, you know? Like, <laughs> like what's up, you know? He's, ah, he's screaming. And I want to be honest, like, of course I took a moment to, to coddle my son, and, oh, you know, I love you, you know, sorry, you know. <laughs> You're so cute, you know. Oh, yeah. But just, I mean, just for a moment, just, just for a moment. And then I said, get up. And I made him walk over the sprinkler. Ah, he's crying, he's crying. I go, we're going to go over the sprinkler because I don't want to raise a victim in my house. I don't want to raise a little kid that anytime an obstacle comes, that he starts being a friend. I said, get up. We're going to the sprinkler. Ah. Then we walked up the sprinkler. I said, put your hand in the sprinkler. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Put it in. He's like, ah. Put your hand, sprinkler. And gets his hand in. As soon as he gets his hand in, he goes, ha, ha, da, da. <laughs> because if I'm not careful, I'll coddle him instead of challenging him. Like, you do realize how insane this is. Why you're 17 months and you're swimming in a pool of water and you're going to cry about some drops of water? I'm getting there. I just, I take my time. I want you to see this. Wyatt doesn't have a problem with water. Wyatt has a problem with his thinking about water. A lot of you, you think you have a problem. It's not your problem. It's the way you think about your problem. It's it's here. It's here. Because Wyatt has already conquered water. The only thing that's changed about the water is the form of the water. But last time I checked, my Bible said no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I can't promise you that the weapon won't form, but I can promise you if you'll make a decision today to stand firm, that weapon will not prosper in your life. You are not a victim. You are more than a conqueror. Can I get a witness this morning? The form is going to change. But you have to predetermine your response. I'm not a victim. 
I don't want to be caught. Get me some people who will challenge me. Get some people who won't actually just let me become what my situation is, but give me some people who will speak to my future. I'm not trying to excuse that some of you in this room have gone through real pain and real tragedy. Some of you had to crawl yourself just to get into this room today, and I commend you, and I honor you, but I am trying to tell you that your legs can be paralyzed, but if you don't get your mind free, you're never going to get past that place. See, we attract who we are. And I look at this man, and society would have put him out in the wilderness, meaning his proximity would have been around other broken people. He would have been around other people of disease and people that are hurt. That's who he would have spent the majority of his time with, but somehow there was something about him. See, a lot of us in this room, if we're being honest right now, is simply this. It's like, you don't like the people you're hanging out with, but instead of like blaming them, you ought to blame yourself because we attract who we are. And misery loves company, but this guy, something was different about him. He said, I'm not going to be treated like a victim. I don't want friends who enable me. I want some friends who empower me. I, I don't need you to enable my apathy. I don't need you to enable my negativity. I don't need you to enable my brokenness. I don't need you to enable my addictions. I don't need you to enable my frustrations. You know what I need you to do? I need you to empower me. I I need you to empower me to be more. I need you to empower me to get back up. I need you to empower me to believe that I can still move forward. I do not need your sympathy. I need your strength. I need your strategies. I need you to believe that God is not done working on me yet. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. My current situation is not in charge of my future destination. Life does not happen to me. Life is happening for me. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody. If you believe it, go ahead and give God some praise. Come on and give him praise. Someone say, check your circle. circle. This man's legs were broken, but his mind was free. And if your mind is free today, you're on the right path to becoming who God has called you to be. It wasn't just that he didn't let them treat him like a victim. The second thing is is that he, he, he wasn't insecure around stronger people. I wish I had time to, (laughs) because this is, this is so very, very important because I, what, what I'll see is I'll see a lot of people in our generation, they'll conquer a victim mentality, but if you're not careful, if you conquer a victim mentality, um, if you're not careful, it won't result in humility. It'll result in pride. So there's a lot of people in our generation like, yo, I'm good. I got a dream. I'm good. Make it on my own. All me. Every day. Let's go. <laughs> but actually, a God dream is not supposed to be carried on your own. A God dream is not for a person. It's for a people. And you need to share the weight with other people around you, that you need others to help you carry that thing and accomplish that thing. But so many people, they start to develop arrogance, and their arrogance is like, yo, I got this all on my own. See, this man who's paralyzed, he could have not had a victim mentality, but how many of you know his thinking could have been free, but all the positive faith thinking in the world wasn't going to get him to where Jesus was. He actually needed some men who had strong legs to take him there. And so he was humble enough to say, yo, you're stronger than me in a category. I need your help. I I need your help. I I quickly learned when we were launching our church and getting ready to start our church that the only way we're going to build a church that's going to impact the world is that I'm going to have to get secure with being around people that are stronger than me and smarter than me and and better than me. I got to learn how to lead people that are further than me. You say, but Rich, how, how do you do that? Well, I'm reminded of what Paul says as he says, His grace is sufficient for me, for even when I'm weak, he's actually strong. That word sufficient is an interesting word. It means uh, just the right amount, meaning that God's grace is just the right amount for, for your race, for your story, that you're not called to run my race. You're called to run your race, and if you'll run your race, God has just the right amount of grace for the season that you're in so that even when you feel like you're weak, you're actually strong because of him. Listen to me. I want to be as clear as I can. If you are intimidated by people stronger than you, smarter than you, better looking than you, wealthier than you, taller than you, more educated than you, I don't know what your list is. If you are, you will live paralyzed forever.
You got to start getting good right now at reaching up to stronger people. If you're the smartest person in your group, you need another group. If you, you need another group, I'm not saying leave that. I'm just saying you need another group. You need to get some people around you that are thinking bigger than you and being better than you and doing more than you that are stretching you and growing you. Because watch this man, he goes from having two bad legs, but all of a sudden these four guys show up. He goes from having two bad legs to having eight good legs because he had the right people around him. Come on, somebody, give God some praise in this place. Someone say, check your circle. Number three, what we can tell about this guy simply by the company that he kept is that we know that he didn't tolerate being treated like a victim. We know he wasn't insecure around stronger people. But thirdly, this is very, very important. He surrounded himself with faith. He surrounded himself with faith. We don't know if he had faith, although I can make a case for that, but we do know that these guys he got himself around, they certainly had faith. Because how many of you know, it doesn't matter if you have the right thinking, it doesn't matter if you've got good, strong friends around you. The real question is, what are they pointing you to? Where are they taking you to? And these four guys, they, they pick this man up, and we see that they had faith. There, there's two ways that we see that they had faith. First is that they take him to this place where Jesus is, and the scripture says that as Jesus is preaching this house, this house is overflowing with people. There's no room left. It sort of looks like Elevation Church, just a packed place. Wherever Jesus is, I think a crowd should be showing up, man. And they got there, and they couldn't get in, but, but these guys, I love them so much, they, they didn't take no for an answer. This is always a great sign of faith, because many times what happens to us on the faith journey is we step out, and when we step out and we face resistance, many of us quit. But real faith, it doesn't stop at no, it keeps trying to find a way. And the scripture says that they go up on top of this house and they dig a hole in the roof. Can you get the picture of this? Jesus is preaching. Imagine right now someone gets a jackhammer and starts jackhammering through this roof and they start lowering this man down. I mean, it's quite the scene. Can you imagine how messy it is? Can you imagine how, how much noise it's making? But see, this is the truth, is that faith that hasn't been tested is faith that can't be trusted. Great faith keeps pushing. Great faith keeps believing. Great faith does not quit. It keeps digging holes in the roof. And some of you in this room, you need to get a revelation that the best way that you can be a good friend is by bringing your friends to Jesus. And I love the mess of it. I don't want to be called to easy. I want to be called to difficult and to messy. I think if we're going to get people to Jesus, it's going to be messy, man. If you come to our church in Miami, it's, it's just messy. I know when Sunday morning starts, it's like, oh, it looks nice, but man, people show up at 5.45 in the morning, 50 people there out of a semi-truck pulling out cables. It's just messy, but everybody is doing what it takes to get their friends to Jesus. I'll do whatever it takes just to get my friends to Jesus. I want to be a part of a messy church. I want to be a part of a church that we're ripping roofs off the place to get our friends to Jesus. He hasn't called us to easy. In fact, some of you right now in this room, you know what your greatest mistake is? Your greatest mistake is that you keep giving up because you're like, it's hard. Like, you just got back here last night and you're like, I don't know, man, it's, it's just hard. It's hard what God's called me to. It's, it's hard to be a Christian. It's, it's hard on the faith journey. Hard? If whatever you're doing is hard, I would say quit right now. Give up, dude. Because he hasn't called you to hard. Pfft. Hard? You need to change your vocabulary. It's way worse than that. It's impossible. You don't serve the God of hard. You serve the God of impossible. And if it's not impossible, I'm not quite sure it's a God dream, and I'm not quite sure it's the thing that he's called you to do. For you serve the God who takes the impossible, and he makes it possible. I'm not trying to do something hard. I need something bigger than that. You need something more difficult than that. We're called to impossible dreams. Yeah. Getting our friends to Jesus, we'll dig and we'll cut and we'll open and we'll get in the mess of it. I'm not leaving. I'm gonna get you to where Jesus is. You can sit down, I got five more minutes. I promise I'll finish on time. It's messy. It's messy, it's messy, it's messy. But we know that these guys have faith because they don't give up. We can't solve your problem, but we know one who can. 
They get this hole in the roof and this guy starts coming down the roof. And the second reason why we know they have faith is because Jesus looks up. I want you to see this in your Bible. And Jesus says, doesn't look at the man, looks at the friends. He says, because of their faith. Someone say their faith. Your sins are forgiven. Isn't that crazy? This is, I'm not trying to mess with your theology. Jesus says, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven. Meaning, because of these man's faith, these friends, the reason why this guy is getting his sins forgiven is because these guys had the faith for him. It's kind of weird because when you read that story, like, if you're anything like me, like you're reading it and you're like, okay, cool, Jesus, his sins are forgiven. Uh, I thought you were omnipotent. Um, I don't think that's why he's there. He, he's there because he wants to walk. <laughs> But how many of you know that Jesus, he'll always deal with the interior before he deals with the exterior? He, he deals with the spiritual need before he deals with the physical need. What good is it to have two good, healthy legs but have a broken soul? He's not concerned with our projected self, and our body is our projected self. He's concerned with the actual self, who we actually are. And so he says, your sins are forgiven. Because guess what? This man, even if his legs do get healed, his body's going to wear out one day and he will die in the physical sense. But because of this moment right here, he has now had his soul redeemed and he will spend eternity in heaven. And it's the greatest miracle you could ever, ever witness. Yet there was a problem, right? Because all the Pharisees there, the teachers of the law, the critics, they're like, yo, 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 this is crazy. Um, no, who does this man think he is forgiving sins? Doesn't he know that only God can forgive sins? You can kind of see Jesus like, Haha, that's who I am, but whatever. But they were really confused. Why were they confused? Because remember, the thinking of the day is his legs are broken because he's full of sin. So how could he be forgiven and still have broken legs? It's not computing. It's not... They don't understand it. There's no context for this. Now, if something's wrong here, there's no way he could be forgiven but still be lying on his back. Yet how many of you know the root has to set before the fruit can appear? And I pray that we would never be a church or a people that get more obsessed with temporary modifications than we do with eternal transformation. I pray that we could be a church, that we could play the long game with people, that even if people's lives haven't fully shifted over in their behavior, that we wouldn't stand on the wayside and judge and criticize, but rather we would be people that would partner and say, we believe the seed of God has been planted in your soul, and we're going to stand with you and water it and believe that God's going to do a miracle. But you got to love Jesus. Jesus is like, all right, I'm not going to always do this, but like, yo, just to prove to you who I am, like this is, I'm so sick and tired of your criticism. Like, don't you know that's much harder to forgive sins than it is to heal the body? But just to settle this whole thing right now, he's like, yo, bro, get up, get off the mat, walk out of here, and move on. Dude gets up, <laughs> walks out in front of all of them, and the scripture says everyone was amazed, and they've never seen anything like this before. What does it show us? It shows us that our God is able to heal, but he's also willing to heal. And if he did it back then, he can certainly do it again in 2019. Don't get me wrong. This whole story, only one gets glory. His name is Jesus. Only one should impress you. His name is Jesus. Only one should cause you to lift your hands and sing a song and to consider and to think about. It's all about Jesus. But I think we would lack wisdom if we didn't pause and look at the context that these four friends, we don't even know their names, but they played a significant part in this man's story. For this man, we don't know a lot about him, but we can certainly tell if Tozer is right that who he actually was based upon the company that he kept was he was a guy that did not let the world treat him like a victim. He was a guy who reached up and said, I'm not going to be insecure around stronger people. And he was a guy, whether he had faith or not, he said, I'm going to surround myself with faith. In fact, I want you just to look down your row for a minute. I know it's awkward, but church should be awkward sometimes. Just look down your row. Just look down your row. Yeah, look at people. It's really weird. Look in their eyes. Super weird. Super creepy. Make it even creepier, you know? And I want you to look down your row because I want you to see what faith looks like. That, that there's faith all around you in here. But I haven't been preaching to you about check your row. I've been preaching about check your circle. Because this program that we're doing right now is awesome. But this is a catalyst for your growth. This is a moment. 
every one of us need to have a group because a group turns a row into a circle. And it's the circle that's going to get you and help you in your time of need. When you get the right group, what happens in life is you might be going through something. You might be having some thoughts. You might be anxious. You might be feeling depressed. You might be afraid. And all of a sudden, you got the right group around you. You're like, yo, dude, I'm not doing so well. But all of a sudden, your group shows up. It's like, yo, we don't know exactly what to do. And we ourselves don't actually have the answer. But y'all, I'll tell you this much. We're not going to let you stay right there. We're going to pick you up. And we're going to take you to one who does have the answer. His name is Jesus Christ, author, perfecter, and finisher of the faith. Check your circle. I hope you're surrounded by faith. It's not enough just to have a row. You need a circle. You need a circle. I'm closing. I'm going to get Jared back up here. I'm going to get uh, my man right here. Can you come help me? My man right here. And uh, I think you can help me too. Can you come help me? Get up real quick. Jared, we're going to close this thing out right. Jump back up there. All right. What's y'all's name? What's your name? Nas, oh, are you on the story? That was beautiful, man. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. And you're a preacher. Like, like your ability to communicate, I didn't miss a word. I didn't miss a word. Everyone's worshiping Jesus, like, okay, this is what we doing now. I was like, yes. What's your name, bro? Caleb, what's your name? Madison. You guys are amazing. Here's the deal. So Jared's back over here. Hopefully this works. I'm very nervous. I don't usually use props, but every once in a while you got to try it. Here's what I want you to see. If you got a circle, I don't know if Jared can get me up to his level, but I got a feeling that four friends, a circle, not just a row, a circle, real people, knowing our names, knowing our story, being vulnerable, being honest. I feel like if I get the right circle around me, I got a feeling that all of you, do you think all of you guys could get me up there? I like this guy. Yeah. All right. Let's just see. How many of y'all believe these guys can all get me up there? Let's just see if y'all can get me up there. All right. Let's go. Can y'all try? Jared, you can help too, man. We're going to need, I don't, don't, I don't, I don't want to fall. Can you help Maddie? Here we go. Can I preach to you for a moment? This summer, you don't need another BFF. You know what you need? You need an FFF, a faith-filled friend. That when you don't have the faith, they'll have the faith for you. When you don't have a worship song inside of you, they'll stand next to you and say, you don't have to worship alone. I got your back. I'm a part of your circle. Come on, somebody, if you believe it today. Every hand lifted, every voice raised. Come on, sing it out. We believe in the youth. Oh, my God, Evan, that was a word. I that was taking was, so many notes. My hand hurts. My hand's cramping up. If you made it this far, this far. give your boy a shout out in the comments. Big J, need dogs. Shout out. If you're not already Love subscribed, you. subscribe to the channel. Everybody knows that. Subscribe. Turn on notifications as well. Mm. And like give and this comment. video a like. Send this message to somebody who needs to hear it. That's a great, oh, that's weird. That's yeah, great. That's great. It just came to my head. That's a bonus good. tipper there for y'all, in case you weren't bonus, paying attention. Bonus, dude. Just send it. Just full send, send dog. Full send. Send it. Let's do it. Just do it. Just do it.